think I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just, well, just the other day. Good morning. I heard it's pretty cold out there today. Man, uh, by the way, this is my mom. Her name is Lisa. She's here to visit. <laughs> Grandma's in town. <laughs> we're loving it. And we're getting to show her all, the, all of our favorite places around here, like Delights, uh, a bake shop. We love that place. <laughs> all right, please stand. But as for you, Bethlehem Ephrata, too little to be among the clans of Judah, from you, one will go forth for me to be ruler in Israel. His goings forth are from long ago, from the days of eternity. <clears throat> Lord, what a mind-blowing concept it is that Christ existed before he was born. From ages of eternity, he came. Lord, we come before you today and humbly just praise you. Come before you, we desire to learn from you, to worship you as one body, God. The body that Christ came to save when he came to this earth. Lord, we thank you for everything you are, everything you do. The blessings you pour out on us are immeasurable. And now we pray together. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, the power, and the glory forever. Amen. And don't go anywhere, Nate. Stay right around here. Uh, turn your hymn books to hymn number 85. Step up on that. <laughs> My mom's here. He's got to do it. 85. You're That's learning right there. me. <laughs> You're right there. Hold your book up one hand. One hand. Use the other hand to leave. All right. Grab a hold of it. Just grab a hold of it. 
one's a great one. Don't put oh, your book no. down yet. We're going to do away in the manger. 86 is across. See, that's three quarter right there. All you're going to do, all you're going to do now is you're going to right. go, you're going to go up and then start to draw a triangle. Uh, not a triangle, a triangle, okay? But no fingers. Oh, relax that hand. Right? Right? I'm ready. Right? Here we go. Away! Here we go. Away! Draw the triangle. Lisa, by the way, he'll be on Facebook and also on YouTube <laughs> and also on our website. For real, right? Oh, for on. real, yeah. This is really, yeah, so real. <laughs> anyway, we're just delighted to be together. This guy's fantastic. Thank you for allowing him to be out here with us because uh, we really enjoy one another and have a lot of fun. And oh. we're, we're a real friendly, we're a friend, friendly church family, so let's greet and say hello, everyone. <laughs> Fantastic, Nate. Very good. I invite you this morning to turn your Bibles to Luke's Gospel. Over these next two Sundays, we will have more of a Christmas-themed message. Commencement of the new year. I don't know if he's told you yet, Lisa, but your son's going to be preaching on the first Sunday of the new year. And we're all looking forward to that. I made everybody in the church sign in blood that they would show up. I haven't. You don't need to, your mom. <laughs> and uh, just one other housekeeping question. Steve Medeus, what in the world are you doing in New Jersey and not in Florida? You're working too hard. <laughs> Robin right now is under that tree. Oh, yeah, that's right. <laughs> Very good. Well, before we read the text today and thinking about how we have a couple of Sundays here, I thought that we would look at two famous cousins over these next couple of weeks. Now, when I think of cousins, perhaps... I'm thinking of Charles and John Wesley, who were famous among the Methodists, known for itinerant preaching and hymn writing, except John and Charles weren't cousins, were they? They were brothers. Of course, I don't want to leave anyone out in the congregation, so for you music rappers, it's amazing what an internet search can do and what it reveals. It turns out, how shocking this was to me, it's changed my life. It turns out that Snoop Dogg and someone named Brandy are first cousins. Of course, they're not on our preaching radar screen for these two weekends. Could you imagine that for one Sunday, a Snoop Dogg? Well, anyway, of course, you Presbyterian theologians 
when I mentioned Cousins, your mind went to Alexander Arch, excuse me, Archibald Alexander Hodge and Charles Hodge, the great minds of the old school of Princeton Theological Seminary, except they were not cousins, they were father and son. So this leads us to ponder, who are these cousins? And is Pastor Dan possibly thinking of H.B. London and his more famous cousin, Dr. James Dobson, of Focus on the Family fame? Many of you are probably very familiar with Dr. Dobson, but his cousin, H.B. London, who's now in the presence of Christ, for a number of years led a ministry through Focus on the Family to the pastoral community and was a great servant of the Lord. But I'm not thinking of H.B. and Dr. Dobson. Of course, not everyone's a theologian or a music rapper here this morning. And some of you who may be imbibers, I was asked what that word meant. If you don't know, you will figure it out. Perhaps some of you are thinking, well, Pastor Dan, no doubt, has his mind turned to the wine producers, Ernest and Julio Gallo. I'm sorry, as it turns out, as much as I had hoped they were cousins, apparently they were two brothers. Then, of course, those of you who are sports fans, like the New York Giants great Michael Strahan, or the Philadelphia Eagles Minister of Defense Reggie White, had a cousin 20 years his junior, wide receiver Chris Matthews, who led the Seattle Seahawks to a victory in the 49th Super Bowl. Not thinking of any of these, Father, as we approach again your word and the greatness of your word, guide us into all truth that we would receive a word from you again today. In Jesus' name, amen. Now then, who would I be thinking of? Well, of course, being a Bible preacher, I'm thinking of that man named John and what was most likely a distant cousin named Jesus. Uh, there is thought that Elizabeth, the mother of John, and Mary, the mother of Jesus, were, were cousins. And so if they were, then most likely Jesus and John the Baptist were second or third cousins. You'll notice, though, that John is born first, and yet was he actually older than his distant cousin? And again, when I mention John, I'm not talking about John the Apostle, I'm talking about John the Baptizer. And so picking up in Luke chapter 1, at verse 1, this introduction to the Gospel. Here Luke writes, Inasmuch as many have undertaken to compile an account of the things accomplished among us, just as those who from the beginning were eyewitnesses and servants of the Lord have handed them down to us, it seemed fitting for me as well, having investigated everything carefully from the beginning, to write out for you in consecutive order, most excellent Theophilus, so that you might know the exact truth about the things that you've been taught. I think most of us are aware that Luke, who was a doctor, was also the same man who traveled with the Apostle Paul on many of those missionary journeys. He wrote two major books, didn't he? The Gospel of Luke and the Book of Acts. You could almost call those volume one and volume two. The recipient of this letter, this Gospel of Luke, was written to this fellow Theophilus, whose name meant a lover of God. And some wonder whether he was an actual person. I think he probably was, but of course, this gospel, even if it was just addressed to him, has touched at this point probably millions, if not even trillions of lives through the centuries. But in verses five through seven, we are then introduced to two key people in this cousin story. In verses five through seven, we read about Zacharias and this lady named Elizabeth. Picking up at verse five, in the days of Herod, king of Judah, there was a certain priest named Zacharias 
of the division of Abijah, and he had a wife from the daughters of Aaron, and her name was Elizabeth. And they were both righteous in the sight of God, walking blamelessly in all the commandments and requirements of the Lord. And they had no child, because Elizabeth was barren, and they were both advanced in years. There's a mention here of King Herod. This is King Herod the Great. We know from history that he reigned from 37 BC to 4 BC. I mention that because for these reasons, for example, there is no zero year BC or zero year AD. I always wondered in what year the Lord Jesus was born because you would think that it was somewhere at that point in time. Well, obviously, the things that are taking place here were in the window of about 5 to 4 BC when actually the Lord Jesus was born. The nation of Israel had 24 priestly divisions, and they had these 24 divisions because every two weeks of the year, each division would go up to Jerusalem to be in charge of taking care of the temple. So the story that we're reading here about Zacharias, this man, this certain priest, whose name also meant Yahweh remembers, Zacharias belonged to the group of Abijah. His wife Elizabeth, it, you'll notice when I read this, was a descendant of who? Of Aaron, the priest who also happened to be the brother of, of Moses. Uh, these were people of quite some spiritual pedigree. Their spiritual condition, though, is explained quite precisely. They were righteous people, I would say, righteous and blameless in the sense of someone like Abraham or Noah, uh, the righteous people of faith. And yet, here is the most unusual thing, because God always promised the Israelites to bless them for obedience. And one of the most important things at that point in time and in history would have been for a woman's ability to conceive a child. So the question is almost raised, well, now what's going on here? Because Elizabeth is obviously barren. There's, she hasn't received that blessing. And yet, here's the thing that we do know in life, we can even say this today. We might not always have the answers until glory, amen? I mean, I probably, I have a few myself I'd like to ask once we get there. But we do know this, that God being sovereign and being loving and merciful also has his own reasons. Remember that fellow that was blind? And everybody thought, well, you're blind because you sinned. It wasn't that. Or they said, well, did your parents do something? Possibly that was the reason. But when Jesus healed him, he said, no, you were born that way because now at this moment, you're gonna see the glory of God. See, there was a reason and a purpose in that. Now, a most interesting conversation takes place when Zacharias goes up for his two weeks of duty and he meets this fellow named Gabriel, who is also Gabriel the angel. Look with me at verse 8. Oh, I should mention this when I said Gabriel or, or Gabriel. I got thinking this morning, you know, when our daughter had the first baby and we all saw his name initially, Linda, we thought how it was possibly going to be pronounced, only to discover that that was not how it was going to be said. And so we had to teach everyone else how we were going to say it here in America. And I got thinking this morning, is the little guy that we're going to see today, back from Slovenia, do his parents pronounce his name Jameson, or do they pronounce it Jameson? Well, I'll leave it there for you to think about. <laughs> I guess we'll find out. At Verse 8, oh, the, tra the traumas of being a grandparent. Now, it came about 
I have a friend, he, his, he told me his, one of his kids' name, his grandkids' name is Pippin. Okay, now it came about, and the other one was Dark Tanyon. And it, they went on from there. It was like Lord of the Rings in their family. Now, it came about while he was performing his priestly service before God in the appointed order of his division, according to the custom of the priestly office, that he was chosen by lot to enter the temple of the Lord to burn incense. I, I forgot to mention that the nation of Israel at this time had between 10 to 20,000 priests divided among those 24 divisions. That's anywhere from 400 to 800 priests. That's a lot of people, right? When they drew lots, this was not about that word I don't like, spelled with the letter L, but this was about providence. They truly believed that when they drew those lots that God would reveal who was to do what. And so out of that 400 to 800 priests, the lot fell to Zacharias to go in and to burn incense. And so the whole multitude in verse 10, they were in prayer outside the hour of the incense offering. And the angel of the Lord appeared to him standing to the right side of the altar of incense. Now, why is this so significant? Remember that the temple itself had that outer court. In the old days when it was a tent, they had that large curtain that went around the entire outside. And then they had what you could say is the, the tent proper that was on the inside where first, before you even got to that tent, uh, there was the place where they would collect the sacrifices that people were bringing, and they would burn them on that altar. Uh, there was a basin for washing. But then that tent that was on the inside was a tent of two rooms, wasn't it? And the furthest in portion the back side was the Holy of Holies, where the altar, the, the holy presence, the covenant, and where God dwelt. Zacharias did not go into the Holy of Holies, but he went into that first room just outside of the Holy of Holies. And that place where he went to burn the incense was right in front of the doorway to go into the Holy of Holies. Now, why is that important? Because you better be a righteous, holy person. Because this, not everyone, except for the high priest, got to go into the Holy of Holies. How often? Once a year. And so, Zacharias, is about as close to the presence of God that you could possibly be. And so here he is. This was no small matter. And Zechariah, now who's there in verse 12, meets someone. And he was troubled when he saw him, and fear gripped him. Why do you think so? Maybe Gabriel's appearance, maybe when, they, when he first saw the angel, maybe in his magnificence and glory, it just overwhelmed him. It may also be that maybe he thought he was about to lose his life. Who knows? But obviously something scared him to death. That's the way we would say it today. But verse 13, the angel said to him, Don't be afraid, Zechariah, for your petition has been heard, and your wife Elizabeth will bear you a son and you will give him the name John. And you will have joy and gladness, and many will rejoice at his birth, for he will be great in the sight of the Lord, and he will drink no wine or liquor, and he will be filled with the Holy Spirit while yet in his mother's womb, and he will turn back many from the sons of Israel to the Lord their God. And it is he who will go as a forerunner before him in the spirit and power of Elijah 
to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children and the disobedient to the attitude of the righteous so as to make ready a people prepared for the Lord. Now, the assumption is, and if you read most commentaries, they would present it this way, that when Zacharias went into the holy place and was taking care of the altar of incense, that he prayed for a child. But if you looked at the original grammar of the text behind this, there's something used here called the aorist tense, which is a funny little tense in the Greek language because it's often indefinite. What I'm saying here is that when the angel says this, that your petition has been heard, there's nothing here that means that he had prayed it inside the holy place. Maybe he had. It may also be that he had prayed for a child decades ago. I find great comfort in that because it reminds me how God does hear our prayers, but often how it's always according to his timing. And actually, I think that the tense that's being used here is to convey that very thought, that what the angel was saying to Zacharias is, your prayer was heard, and maybe so 30 or 40 years ago. God heard you. God heard you. Now, sometimes, and about praying, we should say this, sometimes our prayers can be rather brief, can't they? For example, in the last year or so, when old Woody, I'm referring to my latter, inherited from my grandfather, when old Woody decided to explode into pieces when I was on top of him, I had a very short prayer. <laughs> Help me. Help me. Do you think that, that God is impressed when our, we have such a fabulous vocabulary and eloquent way of speaking? Do you think that God sits in heaven with a stopwatch and says, now there's a rare, rare prayer warrior. I mean, she clocked in at 65 minutes before she was done. <laughs> Nothing wrong with praying for 65 minutes. Please don't misunderstand me. But we all have our way of communicating differently, don't we? Some of us are more talkative than others. Some of us like to tell the story before we get to the point. And we even talk to God that same way. Of course, others, and I tend to be more on that impatient side of things, it's just like, just get to it. Of course, on the other hand, I myself am a storyteller. But here, God is saying through the angel, Zacharias, we heard your prayer. We heard your prayer. I think the most important thing in prayer actually is just honesty, sincerity, coming and speaking to God from your heart. Don't you really think that that's really what God wants? It's your heart. It's talking to him from your heart. And so I believe that God most certainly did hear this prayer and it's led to this declaration that they would have a promised son. Now, I think, and this is one of the reasons why I think that he probably had not been praying this when he was in the holy place, because at this point in Zechariah's life, he had already concluded, along with his wife, that they were not ever going to have a child. So I don't think that's why he was praying it in the holy place, but it was, in fact, a prayer that he had prayed many years before. We're told in verses 13 and 14 that this little fellow's name would be John and he would be a great source of joy to his parents and indeed little grandchildren are a great joy and a celebration. Secondly, in verses 15 through 17, 
John would be unique, and boy, what a statement for life from conception in the womb. Because John was a little person from the time he was conceived. How so? Well, how else could he be filled with the Holy Spirit? And where was he filled with the Holy Spirit? While well, he was still in his mother's womb. His identity was known, a name was given, and John would have a very unique assignment, wouldn't he? John would be just like a Nazarite. He was not to partake, nor was his mother, of liquor or of wine. And he would serve the Lord in the spirit of Elijah as the Lord's forerunner. Now, Zacharias was told, what about this little fellow? Your boy's going to be a mighty preacher, because that's what a prophet was. Prophets proclaimed the truth. And so John's ministry was going to be a ministry full of the Holy Spirit. And, of course, that's actually what we desire for our assistant, Pastor Nate. Uh, the next generation needs young men, don't they? Preacher boys is what they get called, but it's an important assignment. Now, at the end of verse 17, notice this. Because there's a, a phrase here, the way our English versions translate it, it's a tad bit confusing. It says that John's ministry would be to turn the hearts of the fathers back to the children. Now, what does that mean? Does it, because when you first read it, it sounds like they were all bad fathers. And uh, that John the Baptist was going to straighten all the fathers out and make them into good dads. Actually, in the text, that possessive word, their children, is not actually there. They would turn the father's hearts. How? Not so that dads would be better dads, but that the hearts of the fathers would become like the hearts of children. That's actually what this passage means. Jesus said in his preaching what? That they had to become like little children to enter the kingdom of God. The idea here is turning the father's hearts into hearts like children requires what? Humility. And then matching with humility, what else happens? They would become humble and then the disobedient to the attitude of righteous so that as to make a people prepared for the Lord. In other words, they would repent. They would become humble. Their hearts would grow soft. Zacharias was being told, when your son preaches, people are going to be affected right to the core of their very being. And any hardness that was there will be softened. And people will be compelled to turn, to repent, to prepare themselves for the coming of the Lord. What was Zechariah is being told. He was being told, your son's going to lead a Holy Spirit revival. That's what he was being told. Now, there's a kink, though, in the story in verses 18 through 25 between Gabriel, Zechariah, and Elizabeth. How so? Well, we pick up in verse 18 that after Zechariah hears all of this fascinating news, he gets himself into a little bit of trouble. In verse 18, Zechariah said to the angel, how shall I know for this, excuse me, how shall I know this is for certain? For I'm an old man. Do you see why I think that he had not been praying about this when he was in there? I'm an old guy, and my wife is advanced in years. That's a nice way of saying we're not going to tell you her age. And the angel answered and said to him, I'm Gabriel, who stands in the presence of God, and I've been sent to speak to you and to bring you this good news. And behold, you shall be silent and unable to speak until the day when these things take place, 
because you didn't believe my words, which shall be fulfilled in their proper time. And the people were waiting for Zacharias and were wondering at his delay in the temple. Now, you do see the bit of humor here of that last phrase, don't you? Because you know what they were all thinking outside? Did he drop dead? And if he did, who would dare to go in there to even get him in the first place? And that's why in tradition they would tie a rope around the high priest's leg. Just in case he dropped dead, they could drag him out. Well, now, they're all wondering. But when he came out, he was unable to speak to them. And they realized he had seen a vision in the temple. And he kept making signs to them and remained mute. And it came about when the days of his priestly service had ended that he went back home. His two weeks were up. And after these days, Elizabeth, his wife, became pregnant. And she kept herself in seclusion for five months, saying, This is the way the Lord has dealt with me in the days when he looked with favor upon me to take away my disgrace among men. We have to remember that when the, age, when the angel is speaking to Zacharias, he's speaking with whose authority? God's authority. He was just simply the messenger. He was sent from God, and this is what God had determined. And so when Zacharias doubted the angel's word, what happens? He's left speechless. I mean speechless. Is Zacharias a righteous man? A godly man? Oh, and how dare he wrestle with his faith? But I think there's a fresh reminder here that all of us, no matter how close we may grow to the Lord, we may still have those moments and times when our faith is tested. And after all, Zacharias was only speaking the truth. He and his wife were well beyond the years of of having children. Now, this has happened before in Bible history. Nevertheless, it was now happening to them. And so, with his assignment completed in verses 21 through 23, they go back home. And of course, what happens is what you already knew this morning was going to happen with one of the cousins that she conceived this child, and yet she remained in seclusion for five months. I'm suggesting here that it was not until the fifth month that Elizabeth realized, for the most part, by the fifth month, what? Yeah, can't really conceal any longer what has happened. Now, it makes me wonder, though, why did she conceal it for the first five months? I don't actually have quite an answer to that. All I know is that this miracle had taken place. This miracle took place despite the fact that they wrestled with their own faith. I find encouragement in that, don't you? When God makes a promise, even if we fail to always believe him and maybe miss out for a bit in the blessing, yet nevertheless, God is always true to his word. Reminds me of Hebrews 11.1. 1. Faith is the assurance of things hoped for, the conviction of things not seen. You know, you heard me pray earlier. We had a rather frustrating moment, or two or three, on Friday. You would think that the first major surgery that my wife had was, of course, the most difficult one and was indeed the, the most difficult one of them. But here we're going to have this simple, straightforward surgery, all to discover we have to get five doctors for the most part to all agree. And they're all not in the same hospital. They're all located all over the place. And then every doctor, before they want, because of insurance reasons and everything else, don't want to give the go-ahead until they've had all the tests they want done and so as it was working out, not working out, on Friday, they, one doctor wanted to do a particular test on Wednesday, the day before the actual surgery. 
and the possibility of getting that data to all the other doctors, well, it, it just, uh, and also there's then the any anesthesiologist who has to be really the one who's really made happy before they would also go forward with things. So there we were, feeling a wee bit frustrated. But we had to remember that God was still in control. Without faith, it's impossible to please God. Hebrews 11, 6. But he who comes to God must believe that he is. And then God is a rewarder of those who seek him. Heavenly Father, we thank you for this most miraculous story of one of two cousins. And this particular cousin who would prepare the way for the Messiah who was coming. We thank you, Lord, that when we have our times of doubt, when our faith is tested, that you always remain true to your word. And in that we rejoice in Jesus' name. Amen. I think I'm beginning to finally feel okay. I met someone named Jesus just, well, just the other day.